It was on this day in 1984, Kevin McHale clotheslines Kurt Rambis game four NBA finals. And I'm not sure, was Kevin McHale not called for a foul in that? That would have been a playoff foul. Yeah, Paulie. I'm watching the play now. It, it's chaos because when Rambis gets hit, he gets hit by Gerald Henderson first, and then Rambis, uh, McHale's McHale. come from back, the back and hooks him around the neck, but the re- the ref is being blinded. He can't see it. I don't see a foul call. Wow. It's pretty in- I, I'm reading an article here. It says, uh, in 1984, however, maybe hard to believe, but only McHale received a foul for his actions. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was playoff basketball back then, Jeff, right? That was a regular foul. Yeah, there wasn't. I don't, I don't know when the flagrant foul came in to being, but I just my first one that I remember is when uh, I was an assistant with the Knicks and John Starks clothesline Scottie Pippen in, in a similar manner. And I think that was a flagrant foul, but you were not getting thrown out for that back then. That was like bad boy slap on the wrist, <laughs> put the ball back in play. Both teams are playing the we get no respect card. Uh, which one has a better argument in this series? Neither. One's a top seed in the in the West and have, you know, was in, in first place since December. And the other team beat the two best records in basketball on the way to the finals. So I think both have gotten the appropriate amount of uh, credit for what they've been able to accomplish, which is immense. They've done great things. And I think this uh, they, no one respects us. It may play well in their own individual locker rooms, but I don't think it's true. Is this a pivotal game three tomorrow night? I think they always are. I think, uh, you know, the split by Miami, uh, what a great fourth quarter they played. And the two days off lets both teams gather and uh, re-energize and recharge. And I think Denver has played really good basketball for six of the eight quarters. I thought they had a bad first or really like they had two bad fourth quarters. I mean, really like bad fourth quarters in both games and their start in game two uh, was probably very unacceptable to Michael Malone. I know you have to know your team as a coach, but Michael Malone calling out his team for a lackluster performance, especially on defense um, that's not Eric Spolstra's uh, playbook, but it is Michael Malone. Uh, are you surprised at all with that tact, that approach by him? You know, I've always wondered what we want out of coaches. When you ask them a question, do you want an honest response or do you want like him saying we tried hard? Because if you go back and you watch the game, there were – a lot, too many possessions that were either uh, lacked intelligent process or didn't give enough effort to get the job done. So I'm not sure exactly what we want him to say there. Like, yeah, fouling two three point shooters, love that. Um, we got to keep doing that. I, I don't know what we want from these coaches. He could talk in more cliches, he could talk more, uh, you know, around the issues. But I think Denver and their players are used to his directness. And I think okay. uh, if you have the right best players, the the right best players want to be talked to in a straightforward manner. Well, if he was going to be honest and then he actually called out Michael Porter Jr., then I would have said that's a coach who's being honest because Michael Porter played horribly in that game. You're kind of lumping everybody in that we didn't play – it's like we we played 100% 70% of the time, and uh, that's why we lost this game. And then you have Eric Spolstra where Ramona Shelburne is saying, hey, you know, uh, I'm simplifying this, but are you trying to make uh, Joker more of a scorer than a passer? And he basically said it's an untrained eye. Uh, Reggie Miller said the same thing what Ramona said. You know, you, you want to keep him from passing the ball, getting everybody involved in that. Was that a crazy question by Ramona to Eric Spolstra? No. And I think if you watch the game, uh, it would tell you that they gave less help. Now, that doesn't mean they want him to score. Uh, but I think when you watch what their priorities are, when you're playing against a great player, and I don't care 
who the great player is. You can't take away everything, but you need to take away something. And it usually starts with taking away easy baskets created either for yourself or others and the free throws. And I think he had a couple of great passes to Gordon on cuts uh, that led directly to easy baskets. But other than that, because they made him play a lot of one-on-one, he had to score up and through really sound defense. And so I know what Eric is saying, like you, you don't have it in your power to just say we're going to make him a score. But I think uh, Ramona's question was spot on in that they did take away one of his great strengths. Yeah, if those players hit – five of those shots, then he's got a triple-double, or at least close to it, and then we're not even talking about this. But they they made those shots tougher on uh, the rest of the Nuggets. Therefore, he didn't get those assists that he normally gets. We're talking to Jeff Van Gundy. He'll be on the call with Mike Breen, Mark Jackson, Game 3 of the Finals. That's tomorrow night at 8.30 Eastern, tip-off on ABC. What is going on with Kyrie Irving in Dallas? In what way? Well, the story came out that he was recruiting LeBron to come to Dallas, if you believe that. Um, So he doesn't even have a contract with the Mavs, I don't believe. But do you believe that he was trying to recruit LeBron to the Mavs this past year? I I couldn't imagine that because the fit between Doncic, Irving, and and James doesn't seem to be like a – a complimentary, seamless type of fit. So, and I can't imagine LeBron James leaving the Lakers um, by trade. I mean, they just went to the Western Conference Finals. He has a son who's going to play at USC. He has another one who's going to be, I think, a junior in high school who's a very fine player. So I can't imagine James uprooting his family at this point. Doesn't make sense to me. No, I didn't know if it was a leverage play on Kyrie's part or LeBron's part to maybe get Kyrie to go to the Lakers. Could you could you see that? Well, I could see any. I could see it like the Lakers wanting Kyrie Irving. I mean, he's obviously an extremely talented player. Now, how they would create the cap room to be able to sign him uh, to the value that he'll command. You know, that's problematic, obviously, but I I could absolutely – I mean, they've won a championship together. And I think one thing Irving doesn't get credit for, even in that short stint with Dallas, is that he's able to fit in with other really good players. He fit in with LeBron James in Cleveland. With Doncic, he played off the ball more, still produced at a high level. So I, I think he's one of those guys who has – so much skill that he can play in many different ways and always fit in with the really special players. No halftime, no free throws. You've been throwing these out when you get bored. Is that uh, what's going on, Jeff? Well, somebody said to me, I don't agree with you, right? And I said, sometimes I don't even agree with myself (laughs) after much consideration. But, (laughs) but, Can we start smaller? Let's start smaller. Okay. Let's go to the international rule on when the ball hits the rim, the ball is live. And there's no goaltending once the ball hits the rim. I love it. You can knock knock it away or you can put it in. I think would add a lot of uh, really good athletic play. And it would also relieve the officials from making what's nearly an impossible call. So let's start there. I still don't believe... The only guy who loves free throws is like Mike Breen. He loves talking about free throws. And <laughs> and he, I, I always kid him. He loves to wax poetic during free throws about a sob <laughs> story that's been overcome. But it's really the extra point of football. It's boring. It's like it's time consuming. And so I would like to, um, you know, take that out of the game until the last four minutes where pressure free throws Obviously, you wouldn't want to take that away. Well, and wait a minute. Night, we move we move the extra point back in football, so why don't we move the free throw back to the top of the key? Fine. Now now we're talking. Okay. Now we're talking. Okay. Let's do that. All right. Let's do that. Or or let's even get a new line in between the free throw line and the top of the key. Or or even, hey, let's go for something like USFL-ish. 
if you if you want to shoot a three, you could get an extra half point. I don't know. Let's spice it up. The free throw game is boring. Okay, and you can't get dap at the free throw line. We have to do away with slapping hands if you make the free throw or miss the free throw. That's a waste of time. Agreed. And if you miss the free throw, there should be some point of shame and humiliation. <laughs> like, you know. So uh, okay, all right. So we're workshopping this. I I'm fine with uh, take away offensive goaltending, uh, free throws. Let's move them back. No dap at free throw line, and you want to do away with halftime. And and can I add one okay. else? Sure. Because I'm, yeah. I yeah, I've been on this flopping thing for years. It got better for a while. It's regressed because they've eliminated the punishment. They they used to when they made a hard stand on it. They find uh, players $5,000 and they put them on a list, right? And <laughs> for whatever reason, they've gone away from that. I do believe there should be, after evaluation, a scarlet le uh, letter F <laughs> affixed to offending players' jerseys for a certain amount of time. If it's a game, five games, but I think there should be a reminder out there to the officials. Yep, this guy's going to try to trick you, and you're not going to fall for okay, it. Okay, how about this? We get a little letter F, and then we sew it on your jersey. The scarlet F, and then we see how many Fs you have on your jersey that season. Like the Buckeyes helmets. Yes. Or, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. Michigan Wolverines. Yes. Okay. I, I, you know what? I like how you're thinking. Dan, you should be on the competition committee. Well, I did say to uh, the commissioner, uh, basketball's positionless, so you can't have Rudy Gobert on uh, you know, one of the first, second, or third teams all NBA just because he's a center. Get rid of that, and he did. I said we need to have a minimum that you have to play to qualify for any kind of awards. He did that. And the other one was I said you got to get rid of the carrying. It's getting embarrassing. And, you know, the kids in grade school and high school are emulating what they see with the pros. Uh, Jason Tatum can't dribble a basketball without carrying the ball. Jeff, why are we allowing this? Well, every year there's these emphasis, and they always start with traveling and uh, carrying, and they're called for maybe, you know, a couple weeks. And then – People like you're messing with my game, you know, like, you know, it starts to impact. So they go away from it. But like, if you watch a hesitation dribble, you know, guys going and then they hesitate and they lift up a little bit, yeah. it's, you have to carry the ball. Like there's, it, you know, as you lift up, your hand is going to go under the ball. So the fans, the what they call themselves is purists. If they really wanted to see travels called, you could basically call it travel on every possession. Is that what we want? Same with carrying. I think it sounds good in theory, but actually implementing it, it would take away and has taken away. And yet the defense is already at such a huge disadvantage. I know. That we could, we keep making it harder and harder on the defense. You know, very little contacts allowed. And if you let people travel and carry the ball, you know, then they are, quote, unguardable. Well, you go back to Allen Iverson. Did did Iverson create the carry? No, he but he was a he was a great proponent of it. Like he was good. Who's at the it. forefather like, of the carry? Like, you know, that's a good question. Like Vlade I, is to flopping. Like I would say, who was the first guy with the like the spin dribble where they would just like basically cup it and bring it Earl, over? Like, Earl Monroe. Earl, then let, let's give Earl some credit. You know he's. For, for that, and he started a great high school in New York City where underserved children are being taken care of. So I want to give Earl credit for both things. Yeah, but I don't think you want credit for bringing the carry into the game. Well, again, it's such a fine line. And I think this is where a, you don't want it to be called by the letter of the law, like travels, right? So you mentioned Reggie Miller. If he was coming off a pin down to his left, he would catch it on his right pivot foot looking shot. But then if he didn't have shot and he came to a stop, he would go to his left. He would just switch his pivot foot because he felt more comfortable on his left. A lot of people do that. That's like league wide. 
Do we want that called? I think as a league, we have to decide, do we want that called or don't we? Because when you when you say we want travels enforced, I, I really don't think we know the total impact it would have on the flow and rhythm of the game. Okay, are there more travels in an NBA game or holding calls in an NFL game? Oh, get, there's it, more holding calls. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's a hold probably on every play, right, in the NFL, yeah. I would suspect. I, I would think. Yeah, it's like the illegal defense or the defensive three. Like, that's called, like, below once a game. And if you watch it, you know, like you mentioned Rudy Gobert before, you know, he's going to stay in there until they call it. And so, yeah, I, I just think it depends on what we want. All right. What are you going to do the rest of the day? Well, we have to go over and do interviews where Mike asks probing questions of players, <laughs> tries to bring them into tears. And uh, that sounded you know, snarky, Jeff. That sounded no, not at all. That sounded He's snarky. trying to make them reflect on uh, on sad things, <laughs> and, and so it brings a tear to my eye. Yeah, I will bet it does. I will bet it yeah. does. Yeah. And then, you know, we last week we played pickleball. I. And uh, but we sustained an injury. Mike Green playing like popped the calf, so we're down a man. Um, so you know, when you get to this age, like maybe what's called lunch or early dinner, you know, and then we're gonna like call it on it, you know. So I don't get pickleball, I played it once, I don't get it. I, I you know, what I don't really get about pickleball watching it on TV, like. I tried to watch it on TV and I'm like those little dink shots back over back. Like, I'm like, uh, all right, you're losing me now. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I don't get that. It was sort of fun to play, but not as much action as tennis. And I think it's great that uh, people who are not watching on TV on Peacock, that Jeff has double beds here. So a bed for him and a bed for his brother and, uh, or Mike Breen. Yeah. I don't know. I don't He's know the to... cost measures there at the mothership anymore. I I thought we were going to get through a whole <laughs> interview without the mothership, and I am so glad we didn't. But, yeah, you know, I might invite Stan down for a sleepover. I expected a king. I got a, two, <laughs> like, twins. So, hey, Stan, make the trip down. When's, you know? when's the last time you had a sleepover with your brother? Oh, gee, I mean, when – when I was making no money, I went down and, and had to recruit like when he was in New York. So I probably didn't pay him for uh, <laughs> some crappy place he had in Yonkers, maybe. Like that would probably be the last time. Yeah. Uh, play nice tomorrow night with Breen, okay? Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, we're going to try. Okay. Mike, Mike, is, Mike is like like he's coming off back-to-back -back Emmy Award wins. So he's becoming a little bit less, um, uh, what did that call it? Collaborative. He's, in he's in the Basketball Hall of Fame, Jeff. I know. Are you? Yeah. No, I'm not going to be there anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> you, you've contributed to the game. You're a contributor to the game. You're 17th NBA Finals. Come on, if Breen can get in. Well, I think when you, you pose as a serious thing to eliminate halftime, you lose a lot of credibility. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. You got it. Take care, Dan. And that's uh, Jeff Van Gundy of the Mothership, a former NBA head coach. He'll be on the call with Mike Breen, Mark Jackson, Game 3, tomorrow night, 8.30 Eastern on ABC.